One of the advantages of reading through some of the great books in the medieval world is they invite us into a completely different time, different place, so that we might look at their values and compare and contrast them with our own. So sometimes such a comparison gives us um, a challenge and helps us to see our own time in a different perspective. The rule of St. Benedict gives us that kind of perspective. Um, St. Benedict was born in Italy around 480 AD. Uh, he left uh, Nursia for Rome, but his training, he, he became disgusted with it and decided to abandon the training altogether. And he lived in solitude um, in the midst of a strife-torn 6th century Italy. And so the times are unstable and uh, he has left to live in solitude and in the process underwent um, what your book calls a deep religious experience. Um, as a result, he became a monk and eventually founded a monastery and casino. And that's about what we know <laughs> about the life of St. Benedict. Gregory wrote, though, and I think this is important, um, when Gregory referred to the life of St. Benedict, he said, if anyone wishes to know his character and life more precisely, he may find in the ordinances of that rule a complete account of the abbot's practice, for the holy man cannot have taught otherwise than as he lived. So what Gregory is saying is, we have the rule of St. Benedict, and St. Benedict is giving advice as to how to well order a monastery's life, and we can assume, Gregory is saying, because St. Benedict was a um, orderly, godly person, he put together the rules, and it would have been a strange kind of hypocrisy at the time to have written something that was totally at odds with what you yourself lived. So we have no clue that that was the case. Uh, instead, we have a man who is laying out um, what he believes are good and godly rules for the monks to follow, and we can assume that he followed those himself. So that's what Gregory is saying there. So the the rule of St. Benedict is St. Benedict's desire to set down rules to order the life of a monastery. In the midst of the chaos of 6th century Italy, um, as the Roman Empire has fallen and different areas are vying for supremacy, um, in the midst of that chaos, Benedict wants to offer an ordered way of life that gives security and stability. And one of the advantages of, of the monastery um, throughout the medieval age and even into uh, the modern world, I think of Gregor Mendel, the father of uh, genetics, uh, was a monk and was able to escape the poverty of his day to live in a monastery and as a result uh, found, founded a great uh, scientific enterprise. So there we are. Um, so they're an ordered way of life in the midst of a chaotic culture. Benedict says this is a rule for beginners, people who are just entering into the monastic life, um, and it helps to give direction in all of the areas of life that they will face. So there are directions about worship, there are directions about discipline, when you need to be, where you need to be, uh, there are directions about vocation, um, what your work is, your task, and how you are to carry that out. And then there are directions for punishment in those areas where a monk has not lived up to uh, what he has been called to do. The whole purpose of that kind of discipline is to develop virtue in the life of the monk. And so that's what this rule of St. Benedict is, is desiring to produce. Monks who are growing and maturing in virtue, in spiritual maturity, and uh, to eventually be able to um, lead and glorify God in bigger things. There are several kinds of monks that uh, Benedict begins his book talking about. He prefers the first kind. Um, the other ones um, he has some questions about, and we'll see what those questions are in a minute. But monks who live under a, a rule and an abbot, 
in a monastery that means they live under the rules that have been written down they live under the authority of a person with more maturity more spirituality and uh these are the kind of monks that saint benedict is writing to these are the kind that he prefers because of the way in which that kind of discipline that kind of submission to authority produces uh, discipline for life the second kind of monk is a hermit um, these have sometimes been through monastery life and have become, he says, they build up their strength in order to fight against the devil. And so they live in desolate places and they are spending their lives battling the spiritual forces um, that threaten our existence. So those are the hermits, those are the anchorites. One famous anchorite is Julian of Norwich. Um, number three, these, number three and four, Benedict doesn't have much use for. Um, the first ones are wandering monks. They wander around with uh, two or three others. Uh, they may form their own little place, but they do not live under a rule. In other words, they rather do as they please, and they do not live under the authority of a more spiritually mature individual. Uh, and so he he says they're the worst kind of monks, and then he goes on to say, but number four, these kind of monks are even worse than the worst kind of monks. They're the ones that are like the ones that are described under number three, but they wander from region to region depending on the hospitality of, of monastery, monasteries for their existence. They never really settle down and get about the business of discipline and the business of spiritual maturity. So those are the four kind of monks. Um, in the monastery life, then, those monks who have li chosen to live under the authority of an abbot, according to the rules laid down by uh, St. Benedict, then they will take up different jobs, different occupations in the monastery. So the abbot will be the head of the monastery. Uh, he is the one who is the spiritually mature person in which those under him live under his authority and learn to submit to the decisions that he makes. If the monastery is larger and the job of abbot uh, becomes uh, too much to do for one man, then the abbot can choose deans, uh, people who will manage smaller groups within the monastery um, in order to make sure that they get the attention and that the discipline doesn't break down. So you have an abbot, uh, you have deans and larger men monasteries and then another role in the monastery that's mentioned in the rule of saint benedict is a cellarer and this person is responsible for provisioning the monastery and keeping track of the common property and there are rules in here about when to wash your clothes pass them to the cellarer so he knows where they are and then they're redistributed again for the next week um, so you'll catch his role in the monastery as well and then there's an interesting thing um, a passage that he talks about the artisans in a monastery. Artisans are people who have particular skills, and uh, they are skills that wouldn't be common among all the other monks. So they're especially needed in order to carry out some of the businesses of the monastery, to carry out the practices. The problem is, when you have a special skill, um, St. Benedict warns that these people have to be careful not to get prideful and if one gets prideful they are to be disciplined they are to be removed from their particular craft until they submit again to the rule of the abbot so the idea here is just because you have a particular skill you better not get a big head you are responsible just like the other monks for keeping the rule of the monastery there are are pages of directions in St. Benedict's rule about how worship is to take place, when it starts early in the morning, um, and what is to be read and how it's to be read, and monks could even be punished for sometimes misreading the text or uh, not carrying out their daily obligations to corporate worship. Uh, there are even instructions about when to say Alleluia or when to respond to the reading with phrases like, 
Lord Have Mercy, which is one of my favorites, actually. Um, so why all of this discipline? Well, it meant it was meant to keep order in the monastery, and it was it was more intended to develop our spiritual maturity. In other words, what Benedict saw was that all of us need to live in conjunction with others under a common rule, being submissive to those in spiritual authority and learning to live under that kind of uh, rigidness. It would develop spiritual muscle and it would help to cultivate virtue. I liken it to running. If there was a marathon today, you could say everybody is free to run the marathon. And that would in a sense be true. You're not going to limit people from running in your marathon. But it would also be true that I would not be free to run in the marathon because I have had no training. If you get me out on the road and I'm running as fast as I can, I am going to collapse far short of the goal. And sometimes we get this idea that when there's a, a spiritual emergency, what we need is a great um, time of fasting and prayer all at one time to try to meet the need of the hour. But at that time, our strength will fail us unless we have developed the daily discipline so that we are ready with the muscles necessary to run that spiritual marathon. Do you see my point? What St. Benedict is saying is that in discipline, the daily practice and the obligation to perform things on a regular basis help to build the muscle necessary to meet the needs later on. Don't be thinking you can wait until the time comes and then God will give you the strength if you have neglected the time of preparation for that emergency. So Benedict's got a real point here. Discipline is important and our culture in a lot of places has forgotten that need for discipline. Some of the virtues that are, are described in the book as what, what he's trying to cultivate among the monks, uh, they're important virtues and they're ones that have fallen into disrepute in our contemporary culture. The first one, of course, is obedience. Boy, we like to be our own man. We like to live according to our own virtues and values. We will make our own decisions and to submit to the guidance and authority of someone who is older and wiser. We don't we don't think second. We don't think a, a second thought about. And yet for the development of obedience, um, that would be something that Benedict. Of course, we need that. There's a whole description in here about how to be humble and trying to, to cultivate humility in the monastery among the monks. Such a hard thing to do. And in our culture, we don't even value humility at all. We value self-esteem. We value confidence. We even value sometimes a, a braggadocious sort of spirit that I know what I can do. Oh, and Benedict would call us back to humility. Plus, our culture is really noisy. Um, we have a thousand things vying for our attention in social media, on the news, on television, on Netflix, and, and whatever else. Um, and what we need oftentimes is silence. We need an end to the rat race, the, the whirligig life. We need to stop for a minute, breathe for a minute, think about what's important for a minute, and hear the silence. Benedict will also talk about generosity and confession being important virtues to develop in the midst of this corporate life. And I think from that, even if you're Protestant, I think you can pull away um, some of these values. He's got a good point. These are things we need, and we develop them in community. We develop them together. There's a there's a story in the in the beginning of uh, the rule of Benedict, uh, which gives us a picture of what our duty in the monastery would be like. Our job, he says, is daily work, and even sometimes brothers who are sick or weak, he, Benedict says, should be given some type, type of work or craft to keep them busy so that they are not overwhelmed. Um, 
or so that they are not idle. Now, idleness, he says, is the enemy of the soul. And this, this matches what uh, Martin Luther once said. Martin Luther said, if I knew that Jesus was coming tomorrow, I would plant a tree today. And you're thinking, no, what if Jesus was coming tomorrow, man, I'd run around and I'd fix my life. And Martin Luther would say, then fix your life because you don't know when he's coming. But when you have prepared yourself for the return of Christ, then do your daily business, do your daily work. And if your daily work was to plant a tree today, then it matters that you do your daily work for the glory of God, knowing that you are prepared for Christ's return. Does that make sense? If I knew that Jesus was coming tomorrow, I would plant a tree today. This was the problem of the, the epistle epistles to the Thessalonians talking about Christ's return and people dropping their jobs, uh, forgetting that uh, they have a responsibility to their families because they figured the time was so short that they needed to spend that time in prayer and Bible study and in evangelism. Um, and unfortunately, Jesus didn't come right back, and so they, they ran out of money. They had to start living off other people's food. And so Paul has to say something harsh like, let the one who doesn't work not eat. Uh, because he's violating his vocation. And so it was a problem back in the time of the early church, and Benedict is seeing it as a problem in the monastery. But what we're also saying would be something in agreement with Brother Lawrence. He wrote a book called Practicing the Presence of Christ. And he talks in there about doing things like working in the kitchen and doing dishes for the glory of God. That means God is interested in everything we do that there is not a secular, sacred dichotomy in which there's a lot of my daily life that God doesn't care about, every single thing he cares about, and how I do those things on a regular basis brings him honor and glory. So in that, Benedict and Luther and Lawrence all agree. Vocation, our daily work, is for the glory of God, no matter what it is that we do. So we said that maybe there's not this uh, removal of or distance between sacred and secular obligations. Um, so what do I need for my own spiritual growth? Do I need retreat in which I leave my life for a time in order to go someplace where there is peace, where there is quiet, uh, where I can read and pray and come back reinvigorated? Or do I need a place of engagement where I need to be serving in active ministry? I have one uh, teacher friend who wrote that the hard part is not finding spiritual growth in the retreat. It's hard to find spiritual growth in the dailiness of engaging the culture around us. So I think it's not an either or. I think we need both because all of life is in one sense sacred. We play our lives, we live our lives out before the audience of one. That said, we 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 can't get so caught up in um, the dailiness of things that we think that God is removed from those things. In other words, it is worship for me to do the dishes in the monastery. It is worship for me to do the work of the artisan or to do the record keeping that is required of a monk. Um, all of those things are important and rewardable in God's sight. So I think that what we're trying to say here, the value of the rule of St. Benedict for us, might be the following. Number one, I am responsible for my own spiritual growth. That means that I can't shuffle it off on somebody else or just assume that God is going to get it done in my life. It's going to take some intention. It's going to take some determination. And that determination is going to be lived out every day. I am responsible for my own spiritual growth. And then spiritual growth is a regular, even daily pursuit. So I should not think that if I go to this conference or if I get away to this retreat that semi-annual uh, retreats out of the dailiness of life um, are 
um, important for my spiritual growth, but the other days are not. So it's a regular daily pursuit. Um, and then times of retreat are useful for restoration and rest. I think that's borne out in, in the New Testament that um, Paul will say even with regard to our marriages that sometimes it's important to retreat from um, physical expressions of love for a moment for prayer, but then to come back. So that sacred and secular retreat and engaging sort of dichotomy, uh, we have to balance both of those things. Times of retreat are useful for restoration and rest, and then times of engagement are for ministry in the culture around us. So um, we need to live out both. Um, well, what was the results of all this? So um, as a result of the building of monasteries, we have uh, a lot of Roman and Greek literary masterpieces that we would have lost. Um, but monasteries held on to the learning and then began to translate and make it available again um, toward the end of the, the medieval world. And uh, it, it rekindled learning. And so the monasteries played an important role in learning and education in the medieval world. And then look at what monasteries created in terms of social works. They created hospitals and orphanages, schools they were involved in education creating other places of charity and social services all of these things um, came about from the work of the monk involved in the in the monastery so it is not even fair to say that the monks are involved in retreat not engagement as you can see they engage the the world quite successfully in a number of areas so look at this uh, list of attributes, list of virtues that our lives are meant to to build and to emulate. According to Benedict, um, these are some of the important things in developing spiritual maturity. What's interesting is that these things come about by living in fellowship with other individuals. Um, so Benedict stressed the individual obligation to spiritual growth, but he also stressed that that spiritual growth comes as we live with others and we spur each other on toward love and good deeds. So there is a lot that we can learn from this small rule of St. Benedict in terms of what kinds of things are important for our spiritual growth and how we might address issues that seem so foreign in our own day in order to cultivate what God truly intends. Thanks for listening.